Welcome to the Society for American Soccer History's SASH session with Jermaine Scott. He will talk on Harlem's chief representatives, Black soccer radicalism in New York City. Dr. Scott is an associate professor of African American, African diasporic, and sport history at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton. His research interests include the cultural politics of sport, Black politics, Black diaspora studies, black popular culture, and post-colonial studies. His manuscript in progress, Black Soccer, Football and Black Politics in the African Diaspora, seeks to understand how black athletic collectives across the African diaspora negotiated the colonial and racial constitution of modern sports and soccer in particular. He's written for ESPN's The Undefeated, the Journal of Sports History, and the Journal of African American History. I first met Jermaine Scott at the Princeton Soccer Conference in 2019 when he gave a talk on his doctoral dissertation. I knew then that he needed to join us here at the Society to share his groundbreaking work. It's taken a little time for him to get here. You know, he's busy teaching, he's busy, you know, working on his uh, book project. Uh, but I know it will be worth the wait. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Scott. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, thank you so much, uh, the Society for American Soccer History. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, and I'm really excited to uh, share some of my research uh, that I'm working on for uh, the book, um, which is which is in progress. Uh, I, I will say, just so I don't get in trouble by my university, uh, I have not reached the associate level yet. Uh, I'm, I'm still an assistant professor. Uh, hopefully, this book will take me <laughs> take me to the top, uh, or take me over the next the next hurdle uh, to get that associate. So, um, thank you all again for you know for being here for coming out. Uh, I really love the the participation in the audience. Um, so hopefully, this will be a good talk. Um, not all right. So it's it's really not that not that impressive of a, of, a, of a slideshow. So maybe it wasn't worth it, but hopefully the pictures will uh, provide some type of uh, some type of context to what I'm saying. Um, so thank you all again. Uh, again, my name is Jermaine Scott um, and I'm excited to uh, present this talk, Harlem's Chief Representatives, uh, Black Soccer Radicalism in New York City, uh, 1928 to 1949. Uh, so I'm gonna be reading mostly uh, from, from my script and going back and forth with the uh, PowerPoint. Um, so in 1945, a sports reporter for the Amsterdam News, Jerome Melman, sat down with his friend Milt Miller, uh, quote unquote, a nationally known expert on soccer. Melman was interested about the possibility of soccer as a vehicle uh, for racial integration for black athletes. Miller emphatically told Melman that soccer, quote, doesn't bar colored prospects as does baseball, end quote, and, celebrated, and, and celebrated the sport as, quote, the only undiscriminating sport in the world, end quote. I love that quote. Uh, in the post-World War II sporting landscape, soccer in the United States was framed as a sport that welcomed quote unquote, good Negro players. After sitting down with Miller, Melman spoke with Erno Schwartz, the business manager of the American Soccer League, who recalled that quote, before the war in Europe and even, and even a year after, there were always a few Negro teams playing. One I recall is the Falcon Soccer Club of Harlem, which competed in the Metropolitan League. This paper examines a black soccer team during the interwar period, the Falcons Athletic Club, and to a smaller extent, the, Maroon, the, the Maroons Football Club, and their diasporic politics. The Falcons were a consistent feature of New York's soccer network for more than two decades, from 1928 to 1949, and is significant because they reveal, to varying degrees, their refusal to be bound by national identifications and their radical cultural politics against racial and class inequality. Moreover, the story of the Falcons upset the narrative that black athletes were conscripted as American representatives of racial progress and highlights the radical organizing of black worker athletes um, around race and class. While Afro-Caribbean New Yorkers were undoubtedly fans of boxing, baseball, and, uh, and, and basketball, their most heralded sports included cricket and soccer. After working long hours as uh, domestic laborers, porters, and clerks, often dehumanized for simply being black, but maybe given privilege, privilege because of their Caribbean heritage, these workers gathered on the weekends to play. They played cricket during the summer months and soccer during the winter. Following the 1927 tour of Uruguay, 
and Jose Andrade to New York, a soccer team made up of Caribbean players were organized to compete against the other white teams throughout the soccer circuit of New York. In 1928, the Maroons Football Club, often referred to as the Maroons, a Harlem-based Harlem club, first appeared in the New York State League, a smaller regional league than the National American Soccer League. Uh, uh, you know, uh, forgive the quality, but this is a picture of the, the Maroons Football Club. Uh, following the, uh, sorry, uh, from newspaper reports and genealogical research, the lives and organizational structure of the Maroons football club became clear. From their inaugural season in 1928, the black press showed the Maroons considerable interest. The New York Amsterdam News in particular covered the Maroons extensively and quickly noticed some of their members' Caribbean nationalities. The captain of the Maroons, C. Burnett, was, a, was quote, a veteran of the soccer game, having represented Trinidad as an intercolonial fullback, while the manager of the team was Fred Anderson, a World War veteran of the King's Royal Rifles Regiment. Some of the players on the Maroons, like Bill Prawl of Jamaica, were, were, were also World War I veterans and older in age than other amateur soccer players. Prawl, for example, was 40 years old when he played with the Maroons in 1930. Similarly, George Besson of Trinidad, another World War I veteran, was 39 years old when he played for the Maroons in 1930. Prior to the start of the 1930 season, they held elections for the club's officers. Besson chaired, the, Besson chaired the elections and the members casted their votes to elect a president, vice president, financial secretary, recording secretary, captain, vice captain, treasurer, manager, and assistant manager. Indeed, the Maroons Football Club was more than a soccer team. It was a sporting organization of Caribbean war veterans that chose football as their vehicle through which to create a diasporic sociality. The Maroons functioned as the black soccer team in and of the African diaspora. They did not solely play against the other teams of the New York State uh, and later the Metropolitan Leagues, but sought competition with other black soccer teams in the region. Most notably, in 1930, they attempted to schedule a match against Howard University's recently created soccer team to be played at the famous Polo Grounds in New York. And this is a picture of a Howard University soccer team. Uh, Howard University soccer team was created in, in 1928 by Ugandan Prince Hosea K. Nayabongo and head coach John H. Burr. In 1929, Howard played other soccer teams at historically black colleges and universities, particularly Lincoln and Hampton, and emerged as undefeated champions. This impressive feat encouraged Howard University's athletic board to formally recognize soccer as a university sanctioned sport. It was during their undefeated 1929 season that they uh, entered negotiations with the Maroons to play a match in New York. The Maroons were a purely amateur team and depended, quote unquote, upon the league games for their support. They usually played in open fields with no admission charge. And so the contest against Howard at one of the most popular sporting venues in New York would have been a huge financial gain to sustain the operations of the team. However, the black press in New York, specifically uh, the Amsterdam News, had relatively low expectations for the match. Black reporters noted that, quote, there had been, there had been no outstanding colored soccer player in Harlem since the, since the advent of the famous Andrade uh, of Uruguay, who made a tour here some two years ago. They questioned the potential success of a soccer match against two black teams in New York and believed that it was, quote, doubtful if such a venture would pay, would pay at the polo grounds. While it is unclear whether or not the match ever occurred, the initial negotiations reveal how black soccer became sites of local diasporic exchanges where black footballers played within and against American sporting ex exceptionalism and was constituted by a diasporic rather than national formation. Their name should also be considered as a diasporic identification. The Maroons in African diasporic history were communities of enslaved Africans that had escaped plantations and created independent communities, often in obscure ge uh, geographies. Maroon communities were present throughout the Americas and especially in the European held colonies in the Caribbean. According to Cedric Robinson, the Maroons represented the ethos of the black radical tradition and considering the Caribbean ethnicity of some of the players on the Maroons football club, it is reasonable to suggest that they named themselves the Maroons with this history in mind. What is for sure, however, is that the name Maroons signifies a particular culture of resistance in African diaspora culture and political history. Sport historians have already argued that Black teams engaged in a politics and practice of naming that reflected the particular histories of the members of the team, and the Maroons football club should be no different. Soccer afforded Black athletes the opportunity to play against white teams and in turn became a source of racial pride for the Harlem community. 
Although it is unclear whether or not the Maroons played against Howard University, they did regularly compete against white teams in the Metropolitan League. One month into the 1930 season, the Maroons had secured first place in the league, and in one game, even played a game against Mount Morris FC in front of a crowd of 5,000 fans. They even beat the American banknote team, who were, quote, favored by many to clinch the much-coveted trophy at the end of the season. In a match where the good weather conditions brought out, brought out an exceptionally large crowd of fans to witness the clean struggle, the Maroons beat their opponents 2-1. The significance of the victory exceeded the league standings. Indeed, the match had implications for, quote, the question of racial superiority, end quote, and signaled to Black soccer supporters in New York that the sport was just as vital a space for the politics of racial uplift as were other sports like baseball and boxing. Their victory also confirmed the place of Caribbean New Yorkers in the sporting landscape. In a 1929 article titled West Indians in Sport, the Amsterdam News highlighted the contributions of, of Caribbean athletes. Quote, when one speaks of sport as it obtains in Harlem, it cannot be without giving credit to a people much maligned by the ignorant, quote, uh, end quote, exclaimed the, exclaimed the Amsterdam, and praised, the, and praised, quote, the islanders who have written pages in the history of athletes here that will live as long as time itself, end quote. And while the reporter, and while the reporter noted that soccer, quote, has made hardly any hold upon the fancy of colored fans, Soccer football in its, best, in its best stages is played by West Indians more so than by any other group of color anywhere in the United States. Similarly, the Falcon Athletic Club was the most popular black soccer team in New York during the interwar and post-World War II period. And this is a picture of uh, the Falcons. <laughs> Made up of players largely from the English speaking Caribbean, the Falcons were a Harlem-based team that began play in 1928 and appeared to be the most consistent black soccer team in New York for more than 20 years. The Falcons are instructive to deepen our conceptualization of black soccer through its engagement with black politics and its insistence on challenging the racialized governing bodies of soccer itself. The Falcons performed admirably on the pitch. They started the 1937 season with an impressive four wins, two draws, and one defeat. Part of their success was their solid defensive play. Aside from their 1-4 defeat against the Cork Celtics, they outscored their opponents 7-1 in their first four wins of the season. While their, while their defense performed solidly, the Falcons also benefited from improvisational attacks. In an away game against Joa FC, they scored after only 10 minutes, when one of the Falcons, quote, O. Jensen, sent the ball straight between the uprights from right wing in a surprise play, end quote. It was the only goal the Falcons scored, and the game resulted in a 1-1 tie. By 1938, the Falcons, the Falcons firmly established themselves in Harlem's sporting landscape. Prior to the season, the Falcons made, quote, the addition of several new players to the lineup and improved their attack. This was evident when they opened their campaign with a resounding 5-0 victory over the French SC. The popularity of the Falcons began to spread and were, quote, generally rated as Harlem's chief representatives, end quote, in soccer. In the late 1920s and early 1930s, the Falcons were one of the most popular teams in the Metropolitan Workers Soccer League, the MWSL, a soccer league under the auspices of the United States Communist Party. Uh, sorry, under the auspices of the United States Communist Party's Workers Soccer Association, the WSA, and the Labor Sports Union, the LSU. In 1924, the Young Workers League, the youth organization of the Communist Party, officially called for a workers' sports movement that agitated against the, quote, American capitalist formation of sports. They specifically argued that the sporting movement should, quote, develop a physical culture on a working class basis according to the needs of the workers and to act on the side of the workers in the daily and revolutionary struggles, end quote. After a few years of organizing workers, I'm sorry, after a few years of organizing, workers started to create their own leagues. And in 1926 and 1927, Workers in Chicago and Detroit, respectively, created the LSU, uh, the athletic arm of the Communist Party, which became the umbrella organization for the Workers so uh, Soccer Association. The Falcons emerged as an influential organization within the LSU and WSA during the early 1930s. Aside from participating in the different uh, LSU's class and race struggle, members of the Falcons also held significant leadership positions within the, the Workers Soccer Association. In 1934, the Paris, World, the Paris World Sport Congress uh, against war and fascism, quote, called for a united workers sporting front of communists and socialists against fascism, end quote. And the LSU sent a delegation of three representatives, 
Joe Halmos, a track and, a track and field athlete of the Eastern District Labor Sports Union. Richard Heikinen, the National Secretary of the Labor Sports Union, and George Harvey, the National Secretary of the Workers' Soccer Association and MWSL. Harvey was also a Black athlete in Harlem who was a former boxer, long distance runner, and quote, standout soccer player for the Harlem Falcons, end quote. During the Paris games, Halmos placed third in the 200 meter race, while Harvey reported on a number of soccer matches, um, including the Soviets' 2 0 victory over Norway in the finals. Harvey also was a popular figure with the local Parisians. Harvey and Heikinen addressed a crowd of 150,000 worker athletes and supporters, and quote, the game's ruling body further honored Harvey by electing him presidium of the Sportfest Soccer Congress, end quote. While there is very little biographical information on Harvey, his leadership position within the Workers' Soccer Association and the Metropolitan Workers' Soccer League suggests that the Falcons were an important and popular team in Harlem's Black leftist circuit. To the members of the Falcons, sports and soccer in particular, sorry, to, to the members of the Falcons, sports and soccer in particular represented one of the many ways working class Afro-Caribbean New Yorkers articulated their politics around race and class egalitarianism. The Falcons did not just participate in games for the sake of competition. The Metropolitan Workers Soccer League and Falcons transformed soccer into a site through which to organize and stand in solidarity with the unemployed masses during the Great Depression. As part of the Labor Sports Union, the Falcons were familiar with the Communist Party's unemployed councils created in 1930. These councils were popular throughout the US and prioritized, quote, unemployed insurance, immediate cash and work relief, public work at union wages, free food for children of, of the jobless, and moratoria on evictions. Importantly, the Communist Party ordered that the organization of Blacks was a priority if the unemployed councils were to be considered a success. The Metropolitan Workers Soccer League emerged as an organization committed to interracial solidarity in the fight to defend the unemployed. On Christmas Day, for example, in 1930, the Falcons played against the Bronx workers in a, quote, charity game for the unemployed, end quote. The match was part of the preliminary activities to the Athletic Field Day organized by the Youth Department of the Trade Union Unity Council of New York, the Unemployed Councils of New York, and the Eastern District of the LSU. Tickets cost 25 cents except for the unemployed who could attend free of charge, and all the proceeds went to the unemployed councils to, quote, help in the struggle for real employment, real unemployment relief, and the fight for the passage of the unemployment insurance bill, end quote. According to Sam Nesson, the secretary, uh, sorry, according to Sam Nesson, the secretary of the unemployed councils of Greater New York, the Christmas Day festivities were not like the ones, quote, the boss class and their politicians have arranged for bread lines and soup kitchens, end quote. He celebrated the fact that the funds were to be used, quote, to mobilize the employed and unemployed to fight against evictions, to fight for food and clothing for the children of the unemployed and for appropriations from the city government for the unemployed relief. Above everything else, however, it was the Communist Party's legal defense of the Scottsboro Boys in the early 1930s that solidified their political appeal to Black communities from Alabama to New York. The Labor Sports Union contributed to the fight to free the Scottsboro Boys. In 1932, they started to organize, quote, free Scottsboro Boys street runs, where black and white athletes ran through the main streets of major cities, quote, with placards affixed to their chest saying, free the Scottsboro Boys. One such protest, one such protest run uh, was nearly two and a half miles, quote unquote, through the streets of Harlem and was considered to be probably the largest. The street runs were militant demonstrations protesting, quote, the infamous legal lynch verdict against the Scottsboro Boys, end quote, and distinguished the labor sports union from other liberal sporting organizations. When the Communist Party entered the popular front phase, which encouraged coalitions between leftists and liberal organizations in a unified fight against fascism, the Metropolitan Workers Soccer League, the Workers Soccer Association, and the Labor Sports, Un the labor sports Union dissolved. In 1935, the Falcons transitioned to the Metropolitan League um, however, their experience in the Metropolitan League was drastically different from their time with the Metropolitan Workers Soccer League. Specifically, it appears their membership was limited to on-field competition because they were otherwise excluded from the league social events. The secretary of the Metropolitan League was Jimmy Graham. And in January of 1937, the Irish Echo newspaper organized a party in his honor at the Innisfail Ballroom in Manhattan. All the members of the Metropolitan League received invitations to the party, including the Falcons. However, when Freddie Powell, his future wife, Lucille Brown, and his teammate, Austin Alexander, uh, Austin Alexander who 
quote unquote, representatives of the Falcon Athletic Club arrived to the party, they were, quote, refused admittance on the grounds of color, end quote. They were told that the proprietor of the ballroom, Mr. Henny, quote, would not permit Negroes to enter the building, end quote. All three representatives of the Falcons were outraged and Alexander, quote, demanded that he be permitted to speak to the, to the proprietor, end quote. After which he was told that Mr. Henny had gone home with a toothache. <laughs> to add insult to injury, the sports editor of the Irish Echo who sponsored the event, quote, merely, said, merely shrugged when confronted with the, merely shrugged when confronted with the discrimination and refused to do anything to help his colored guests, end quote. After the injustice, the Falcons intended to file a civil suit with the local chapter of the NAACP against the Innisfail Ballroom, quote, for violation of the civil rights law. Uh, while it is unclear whether or not the Falcons filed the suit, the Innisfail Ballroom incident complicates the narrative that soccer was a sport free of racism and discrimination. Following their experience in the Metropolitan League, the Falcons registered with the newly created Manhattan Soccer League, formerly known as the Metropolitan Workers Soccer League for the 1940-1941 season. And it was one of their most successful campaigns. So the same communist uh, soccer league, the Metropolitan Workers Soccer League has now become the Manhattan Soccer League, which the Falcons uh, are joining in 1940-1941 uh, season. And it is their most successful campaign. They opened with a statement win when they quote, defeated the Brooklyn Edison team, white, five to one, end quote. <laughs> a few weeks later at Van Cortland Park in the Bronx, they quote, defeated the Brooklyn Collegians, white, four to three, end quote. While, quote, the Harlem Club was tagged to win handedly, uh, the, the quote unquote white boys finished the first half in the lead three to two. After a Falcons penalty, even the score, a stellar attack by the Falcons concluded when Joe Buzzle received a cross from his teammate and with a display of sound technique, quote, blazed a first time shot through the enemy's goal for the winning tally, end quote. The team carried this success into the following season and as a result, won the Manhattan League Cup for sportsmanship on the field of play. The story of the Falcons and Maroons to a lesser extent alters the existing scholarship on black athletes during the interwar period. The Falcons articulated a radical and militant black politics that imagined an alternative relationship to national culture as black athletes. The Falcons were not concerned with the liberal politics of integration, but rather a leftist politics of black workers' rights. Their identities were not bounded by ideas of American patriotism. Rather, the diasporic formation enabled a more radical politics that questioned the role of sports in producing or destroying racial and class systems of power. Expanding the geographical imagination of Black athletes in the US in turn generates new histories and new possibilities, new narratives and new politics. The Falcons must be situated within a long tradition of Black athletic activism, that seems to get lost in the historiography of black athletes in the interwar and post-war period. The Falcons present a different story of militant resistance and engagement with the leftist politics of black communities. Contrary to the narrative of depoliticized American heroes, the Falcons run the front lines of the race and class struggle in New York. Shifting our attention to understudied sports such as soccer highlights the centrality of the sport in Harlem's black community and uncovers the political functions of black soccer in New York during the interwar years. Uh, thank you so much for your attention uh, and I hope you all um, enjoyed the research. Wonderful, Jermaine, thank you very much for that. And uh, I wanna open up the floor uh, to some questions. Uh, I see a couple hands. We're gonna go with, with George first uh, and then Kevin, uh, but please, um, you know, say who you are, where you're from, and then the question. Thank you. Sorry, there there wasn't actually a question for me. That was just uh, just a pause there. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> you know, one um, if I may, one one argument that I'm trying to make is that um, the ways in which Black athletes uh, or the historiography of, of, of Black athletes and Black athletic activism is framed in this interwar period is, is largely through, um, you know, through the careers of, say, someone like a Jesse Owens or, uh, or a Joe Lewis, right, where, they're, where they obviously are, uh, you know, challenging racist stereotypes, right, about, about Black inferiority, but they are also framed and, and caught up um, within this kind of American narrative 
of exceptionalism, uh, American patriotism, um, and almost held up as kind of poster boys, right, of racial American egalitarianism. Um, and so I wanted to show a way in which, when we look at soccer, when we focus on the sport of soccer, um, we we uncover these teams like the Falcons, right, who are who are in, you know um, who are central to this leftist organizing, this black leftist organizing, uh, which is not just um, which is not just felt in New York, right? But but they're engaging with different movements, of course, the Scottsboro Boys. Um, and so I'm trying to provide a different perspective of Black athletic activism that is more in line with a leftist politics than more so the um, kind of the traditional liberal um, political narrative that we get uh, with, with 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 some of these uh, African American athletes like uh, like like a Joe Lewis or 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 Jesse Owens. And I say that because. Um, I've gotten critique, right? <laughs> no, Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis, they did, they did so much, right, for, for you know, um, for racial equality, and they did, right. And and I'm not, I'm not denying that, um, but I'm also trying to just show another, um, another uh, range of political activity uh, that Black athletes were, were were participating in during this, during this time. So, thank you for that, Jermaine. Uh, Gabe Logan, and then. Uh... Kevin, please. Thank you. Thanks, Jermaine. Uh, nice to see Thank this. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, yeah. Gabe. Yeah. yeah, it's nice to see this further develop. Hey, those uh, pictures are uh, this Gabe Logan. Sorry, for, forgot for the podcast. <laughs> Jermaine, those uh, artifacts you have of the Maroons and the Falcons are really nice. Uh, building on our conversations where we were trying to locate Harvey, is he in that image of the Falcons? He, he is not in that image uh, of the Falcons, uh, unfortunately. And um, I'm still having trouble finding more, <laughs> more information on, on Harvey, but no, he is not in that image. And I could not find, um, I actually couldn't find a lot of images of the Falcons. I think this is like one of maybe one or two images circulating um, of the New York Falcons. Um, but no, he is not, he is not part of that part of that image, unfortunately. If I could follow up on that, uh, how far were you able to trace what happened to him before the trail went cold for you? Um, really, after the Paris, uh, the, the event in Paris, the trail does go cold, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, well, his trail goes cold. And I think what's interesting is that the Falcons continues, right? The, the you know, the, the, the story of the Falcons and the team itself continues beyond uh, George Harvey. And so there's a way in which he is definitely central or, you know, definitely obviously holding um, high leadership positions within the Workers' Soccer uh, Association. Um, but there are other individuals within the Falcons that are able to kind of carry the team on. And so I'm, I'm interested to know what, what happens to Harvey in, in, in terms of his politics and just his, in, you know, in, in his general, uh, in his general uh, life and playing career, you know, his athletic career. Um, but what I find interesting is that the Falcons continue um, at least for another, you know, at least for another decade um, after, after we get, uh, after we get George Harvey. Thanks. Great research. And they, and and you know uh, I I must say thank you so much, Gabe. Uh, you know for for all of the help um, in kind of compiling all this research. Uh, your article was just fantastic, and uh, it really kind of opened up a whole a whole other door to this story. So thank you so, so much. So does your work. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Go, Kevin Talek Marston, and then David Kilpatrick and Chuck Carlson. So uh, please introduce yourself and then your question. Microphone, that's better. Kevin Talek Marston at CIS um, in Switzerland and Demofer University in Leicester. Uh, thank you so much, Jermaine. Um, it's really nice to actually hear you after having read some of your work. So it's uh, really, really fascinating stuff that you've been doing. Um, and it's really neat to see the links, obviously, with with Gabe's work on the on the worker sport and the communist sport um, stuff in the yes. Midwest in Chicago. Um, I, I was I was intrigued by a couple different things. Um, first of all, in those photographs, there's amazing photographs. Um, yeah. I was I was curious about one or two things uh, um, in terms of the of the photographs. Do you have any sense if there is any 
uh, let's say permeability in those clubs and teams that you saw, are they, are they integrated in any way, shape or form? Um, because one of the things that I, I wondered about in this period um, is, is whether you do have any crossover between ethnic communities, racial communities, et cetera. Did you send, do you get in the sense of any crossover or are they more, let's say, are they all strictly Caribbean um, West Indian um, immigrants um, from the Caribbean. That's kind of the first part. And then I'd have a follow-up um, bit mm -hmm. on, um, which is more just concretely. I'm, I'm curious to know more about where, where they played. Where did this league, um, it's a league I don't know a, a whole tremendous amount about. And so I was curious, you know, where they played and then the, uh, the name change and shift that you mentioned in, the in 1940 where you say that, you know, the Metropolitan Workers League becomes then the Manhattan Soccer League and they drop the workers. And I found that kind of intriguing. Why do they drop the term workers? Is it because yeah. we're in a post um, 1930s where we want to kind of distance ourselves from the American Communist Party at that point or not? Mm -hmm. is, the, is it a conscious decision or is it just, is there, is there any, you know, what's the context around that? So, yeah. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so, so, yeah, so I didn't find crossover between teams. What I did find crossover was between sports. And so there will be a number of players that played for the Falcons that were also playing for cricket teams uh, throughout New York, right? And so there's ways in which soccer and cricket are just are super related, particularly in New York, particularly with this um, this large Caribbean population. So that's the that's the main crossover that I saw, um, and it was fascinating because in the research, I'm I'm trying to find um, certain players. You know, I'm like looking up like the you know the trails of these players, um, and sometimes I'll find a player, but it'll be connected with a cricket club. And I'm like, wow, is this, is this the same player? And so I'll have to do like extra research to figure out, yeah, actually it was the same player. Um, so there were a number of different instances uh, where I found players that were playing um, for the Falcons that were also playing for different uh, cricket teams uh, throughout Harlem. Um, and they played they played all over, to be honest. Um, I'm trying to go back back through through the article, but uh, one of their main one of their main fields of play was um, was uh, Van Cortlandt Park uh, in the Bronx. Um, there were, uh, you know, they played throughout Brooklyn a lot. Um, I'm trying to pull up, there's a fascinating, uh, there's a fascinating quote from one of the sons of the players. Uh, the, one of the players was Freddie Powell uh, and I was able to find his son actually. Uh, and <laughs> He was talking about all of the different um, experiences of traveling with his dad on the subway early morning during the winter time, and it was freezing cold. And they'd be out on the soccer field, and the ice would be almost frozen over. But all of the players would be there, all of their all of their kids would be there. Not so much their wives, but their but but the kids. Um, so they played really all throughout. Um, they played all throughout New York. I would I would say. Um, and then the last, the last question about the, the dropping of the workers, you know, I do think it is part of this um, kind of increasing anti-communist sentiment that is emerging uh, around World War II, uh, particularly uh, uh, in, a, in, in uh, the post-World War II era. Um, speaking to, again, speaking to the son of Alfred Powell, Freddie Powell, uh, who was the captain of the Falcons, he mentioned that both of his parents were heavily involved in um, in labor unions at the time, and that they actually had to step away from the labor union activity because of this increased anti-communist uh, anti-communist um, anti -com anti sentiment that was um, that was happening in the U.S. at the time. So I definitely think the team was very conscious of the overall kind of grander political. Um, political context and, and the implications of being affiliated with uh, a communist league or a communist affiliated league. Um, I think they understood that. Um, but again, what's interesting is that, you know, I, I, I think the main thing that's interesting about the, uh, the, uh, the Falcons is that it's their longevity, right? That they, we first find them in 28 and, 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 and we see them all the way up until 49, right? And 49 is when we start to see kind of this ramping up, like this really ramping up of that anti-communist uh, sentiment. So um, in, the, in the larger article um, that actually is in the Journal of African-American History, um, I talk about how the kind of um, this anti-communist sentiment in the U.S. kind of is one of the reasons why we see um, 
the Falcons dissolve right at the end of the at the end of the 1940s. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Hi, I think I'm next in the queue. David Kilpatrick, Mercy College, uh, New York. Um, Jermaine, thank you so much. Uh, absolutely mind blowing. So exciting to think about uh, what you what you've been brought to get what you brought together here for all of us to consider and and then all the the possibilities and permutations of possibilities that 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 this opens up. Um, I, I could ask 101 questions, but I'll try to keep it to one. Um, I I'm especially fascinated by um, you know the, the, these clubs that were that were in the uh, Metropolitan uh, Workers Soccer League. Uh, you know clubs. You know some of these the names of these clubs, the brands, if you will, Harlem Progressives, Ficta AC, uh, yeah, yeah. Spartacus. Right. I mean, there's so many so many fascinating clubs. Uh, so I'm I'm curious if you've sketched this out yet. Um, I guess okay. I'm gonna I'm lying. This is two questions. Uh, in terms of uh, coverage. Right in terms of um, newspaper coverage, I mean, I think you mentioned that you know the Daily Worker, obviously the Brooklyn Eagle covered some of this, uh, the New York Amsterdam News. Again, I'm thinking too about these entities that are still ongoing. So that um, Innisfil ballroom incident with the Irish Echo um, is yeah. really, whoa! I mean, talk about you know Tom McCabe's always talking about complicating the narrative. Oh my yeah. word! Wow, what an incident! Uh, and, and so I'm thinking, you know, especially I'm curious in terms of the coverage of the Daily Worker. I apologize. I don't know enough about this yet. Something I've wanted to deep dive into. Gabe Logan might be able to, to have something to say about that. But um, these are linked then. So uh, the two questions are linked. What kind of coverage did you see in these different respective newspapers in soccer more generally and then in terms of clubs? And did you see any movement of players between these clubs? So in other words, any of these players on the Falcons, did any of them play for a FICTA AC or the, the Harlem Progressives or any of the other clubs? And, and uh, to what degree was ethnic identity? And you, you used the term at the very beginning um, of the talk in terms of the Falcons' rejection of nationalism, yeah. I think yeah. is the term used. So um, yeah. especially when, when New York soccer had kind of gotten embroiled into these ethnic nationalistic uh, club identities, uh, to what degree do you see that negotiated in the Falcons most specifically or more generally amongst those those clubs that competed against each other at that time period? Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. So, you know, the coverage of uh, coverage of early soccer uh, in the U.S. is, is very difficult, it, it, particularly in the in the newspapers. Right. Oftentimes. Uh, we'll just get scores, right? So it's just like all of these, you know, different leagues, and then all we're getting is, you know, the scores. Um, every now and then, we'll get a juicy article, uh, and by juicy, I mean a description of the game, <laughs> and then even more juicier, we'll get some, you know, kind of player profiles. Um, and so that's I didn't get a lot of player profiles. Uh, sometimes I got um, a few player profiles uh, from the Amsterdam News. I think what made the coverage of the Falcons and the Maroons particularly interesting uh, for the Black community in Harlem was that, again, there's this idea, right, that, that, that Black people do not play soccer. Right? And so when there's a Black soccer team in a predominantly white sport uh, in New York, it, it's, it's going to gain, a, you know, it's going to gain attraction, right? And so the New York Amsterdam News did a good job um, of, of providing a little bit more in-depth detail about the players themselves. Uh, they're coming from Trinidad. Um, some of them are coming from Trinidad. Um, but I also had to do a little bit of uh, kind of just genealogical research and kind of <laughs> plug some names into the census and kind of trace it that way, find different, um, you know, you know, uh, ward, you know, draft cards and, you know, registration cards and all these different things to kind of piece together a story of who, you know, of who these players were. Um, so that was, that was the coverage, uh, you know, it was... <laughs> It was more frustrating than anything else, right? Because about ninety percent of the coverage was just scores. <laughs> if I'm being completely honest, um, the Daily Worker had a few um, had a few interesting articles um, on soccer on the on the workers uh, on the workers soccer association that that again provided more context about the league, but not so much about um, the Falcons themselves, right? Um, most of that, most of those player profiles, most of those. Um, kind of biographies and kind of contextual details were coming from uh, the Amsterdam news. Um, and I would say, yeah, so one one thing I'm trying to do with 
with the paper and with the Falcons uh, and with this, uh, this concept I'm working through called Black Soccer um, is to show the ways in which Black footballers, Black soccer players are um, uh, playing, you know, what I like to call playing within and against national identifications, right? So oftentimes when we find uh, black soccer or how we conceptualize black soccer, it's it's usually pushing against national boundaries, um, whether that's because of history of colonialism and slavery, right? Whether that's thinking about the broader African di uh, diaspora uh, and the ways in which soccer circulates through, uh, through these different spaces. Um, one kind of central feature of black soccer is this very diasporic uh, transnational quality that I'm trying to, um, that I'm trying to push. And so, um, you know, what does it mean when a lot of the soccer teams in New York at the time throughout the U.S. are are divided based off of nationality, right? This is a team of, you know, French players. This is a team of Irish players. This is a team of German players, right? And so what does it mean when the team is a team of Trinidadians and Jamaicans and Guyanese, right? And so I'm thinking about, you know, how when we look at Black soccer, it's actually interrupting. Um, some of the more traditional narratives about U.S. soccer that we have, right? I mean, we, we know that soccer is seen as the immigrant sport, right? And usually that's, usually that's framed through uh, immigrants of European descent, right? And so when we look at immigrants of, of Caribbean descent, of African descent, we start to see different um, formations of team, right? Of, 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 of the team, right? That is not just focused on one particular nationality that black soccer kind of um, generates this more diasporic, um, uh, more fluid uh, identification uh, to the nation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think I'm next. Does my audio sound normal? This is, it's good. That's great. I'm yeah. Chuck Carlson. Uh, I'm club historian for Chicago House soccer team in Chicago. Nice. Been nice. doing a lot on Chicago soccer history. Um, nice. And I, I know you talked, Dr. Stock, about the um, movement to Paris and the international yes. part yes. of this. I'm wondering if you have any evidence of it coming the other way towards the Midwest. And one of the yeah. teams, 1947 Chicago professional team, was the Chicago Maroons, um, right. which, That's of course, right. had That's Gil right. Heron on yes. the team. Yes. Um, yes. In 53, again, you have the Chicago Falcons winning the U.S. Open Cup. So I'm wondering if there, there's any connection with that, firstly. And then secondly, on the cricket front, um, I see quite a bit. I go through the Chicago Defender a lot. And a lot of the sports information I get about soccer is in cricket articles. <laughs> yes. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the importance of cricket uh, yeah. in, in communities too. So thank no, you. No, thank you so much, Chuck. And I, and I hope we can talk uh, a little bit later in the future because, yeah, I would, love to, I would love to just, you know, uh, chop it up with you for a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, yeah, there, there are some striking similarities between New York and Chicago. Um, actually, when I was in Chicago, so I lived in Chicago for six years while I was uh, uh, getting my uh, PhD. And um, one thing I noticed was, of course, that there is a strong Caribbean population in Chicago. And as such, there's a strong history, a long history of cricket clubs uh, in Chicago. I remember going into a Jamaican restaurant <laughs> up in Chicago. And on the wall, there's a cricket, you know, a couple of plaques of different cricket teams, right, from the 50s and 60s. And so, um, yes, yeah, there, there are a lot of um, interesting similarities. Um, during the time, yes, I, I think I did find one or two Caribbean uh, teams in Chicago um, around the same time. So I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure of the relation of the two right but 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 we see but we see very kind of parallel uh formations happening both in new york and in chicago right now i mean i mean and that's just not through sports right we can think about kind of black cultural productions um uh in general but um i think soccer and cricket is also uh, a fascinating uh point of research for chicago and i think the importance of cricket again i think that's where you know that's where you see that crossover right is you know, players, you know, are, are playing on the soccer team. They're also playing on the cricket team, right? And it's just these two um, kind of cultural staples of the Caribbean community um, that allow them to not only kind of recreate 
uh, feelings of home, right? Feelings of belonging in, in these new spaces, in these new uh, urban centers. Um, but, but it's also sites, you know, which I try to argue, they also become sites of diasporic exchange, of diasporic politics. Um, and cricket, you know, I mean, I've, yeah, I love cricket. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of cricket, so, to be honest. Um, and so I'm a big fan of the West Indies cricket team. Um, I've, I've, I've done some research on them. Um, during the 1960s and 70s, um, of course, their their interactions with uh, uh, South Africa and all of these things. So, so yeah, I'm I'm very much a fan of cricket. Um, and hopefully, one day in the future, I will I will write a book about I'll write a book about uh, cricket, local cricket in New York. Actually, there's a fascinating article I found in I think it was the New York Times actually that that did a a feature on West Indian cricket in New York. It's a fascinating. Uh, I wish I could pull it up. It's a fascinating article. Um, okay, let me not let me not waste time. Uh, but it's a fascinating article that that has these very like striking images, uh, almost like uh, these caricatures of 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 black cricket players. Right? And they, you know, it's it's racist caricatures. But the the, the article itself um, is is just fascinating, and it, and, it, and it really reveals kind of the world of West Indian cricket in in the the interwar period in New York. It's a fascinating article. If I if I can find it, I'll uh, I'll see if I can send it to Tom and uh, have him have him send it out. But uh, yeah, the the relationship between cricket and soccer I think is is critical when thinking about um, its significance to Caribbean communities, particularly in the U.S. For sure. Thank you. And Maroons and Falcons, any evidence of any relation that those were called? N not yeah, I haven't found evidence of. The Falcons, the a relationship between the Chicago Falcons and the New York Falcons, or the Maroons. Um, I do think the wow, yeah. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm kind of blown, I'm kind of blown away to to hear this. To be honest, we'll talk. Uh, but, we'll talk. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, this is why I want to talk. Right? Um, but the Maroons could uh, just be a kind of a further signifier of this kind of history, uh, this history of, uh, you know, African resistance, African diasporic resistance, uh, that I tried to talk about a little bit in the paper, right, that this, this name could be adopted uh, across different teams. I think actually there's a hockey team in, in Canada at the time called the Maroons, right, and so there's, you know, there's a lot of interesting, uh, there's a lot of interesting kind of symbolism around, uh, around the Maroons, and whether or not they named them with this in mind is, is still unclear, um, but nevertheless, that name does signify a certain um, political significance uh, in African diasporic history, for sure. Uh, Jermaine, I think it's uh, uh, my turn. It's uh, Chris Boltzmann in uh, Los Angeles, Cal State Northridge. Um, Hi, Chris. Presentation and uh, excellent, excellent research. Um, my question, very short, short question, is around the international component, the transnational component you mentioned. Is there ever any discussion of taking um, either the teams back home to the West Indies, mm -hmm. and is there ever any press coverage of the team in the in the local press in Trinidad or in Jamaica or in yeah. Guyana, for example? And that's my question. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. No, thank you so much, Chris, for that uh, question. You know, I haven't found evidence of those two specific teams, the Maroons and Falcons. However, I did find a team called the Western Tigers, uh, which predates the Maroons that I didn't talk about a little bit. That, well, yeah, that I did not talk about in the in this talk, but is in the kind of longer piece article that 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 talks about the Western Tigers um, and their ambitions to go to Africa, right, and to kind of spread the game throughout Africa because according to the article, everyone, everyone in Africa is playing soccer, right? And so why not go out there? And so I try to make this argument again, this is during the 1920s. Um, they're based in, they're based in Harlem, New York, right? With the Western Tigers. And so I try to make this argument um, that they may have been sympathetic, right? To these ideas, to these black nationalist ideas, right? Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, um, the Back to Africa movement, right? It seemed like a very kind of random article right it was just kind of this one article talking about this black soccer team going you know wanted to go back to africa right and so um there's so with that example i think that's um kind of one transnational example to think about how these teams are received elsewhere outside of the us um i also talk a little bit about uh, jose andrade of uruguay um and his time in in paris during the olympics 
um, and just kind of the spread, you know, as a as a black Uruguayan, the spread of football, um, his his time with <laughs> Josephine Baker, uh, and kind of the popular the the the, the Parisian popular culture scene. Uh, during this time, um, he he brings that same team to New York, I believe, in 1927 or 1928. Uh, Harlem is very, very keenly aware of this black soccer player, Andrade, from Uruguay that's that's coming to town. Um, and so, again, the Amsterdam news is, 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 is a little goldmine uh, to, to kind of trace uh, these kind of early black soccer um, histories. Thank you again, Chris. Appreciate that uh, question. And uh, I just wanted to circle back. Uh, Gabe Logan uh, provided some clarification on the Chicago Maroons, uh, which uh, were also known as the Italians uh, AC, and the Falcons came out of the Polish community. So, uh, yeah. Thank you for that, Gabe. Uh, hi, Dr. Scott. This is uh, Patrick Sullivan. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Patrick. I wanted to say thank you again uh, because I've been really looking forward to this this presentation and. Uh, I've enjoyed the, the article you've done as well. Um, I guess I wanted to shift things a little bit. Um, I was kind of curious, and, and if you're, this is part of your current research, don't give anything away if you're not ready, but I was you know, just talking about Howard and the early history of soccer and HBCUs. Yeah. Have you done any uh, extended research into uh, early soccer and the HBCUs? Um, uh, yeah. Because yeah, I tried to look a little bit here locally with Spelman and Morehouse, but uh, sure, I sure, sure. some of the new to the newspapers, but I was just kind of sure. curious. And then I guess a second question to that would be um, with regard to the teams in New York, were you seeing maybe any students from some of these schools, uh, you know, joining the teams that you were researching in New York? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the, I'll answer the second one because it's a little easier. So, no, I did not find uh evidence and so a, a lot of the players on the falcons were were older players right so a lot of them were in the in their late 20s their late 30s right I, a couple of players were you know 40 39 years old so you know it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating makeup of the team itself um but in terms of hbcu soccer right there's um i still want to do more research on this early period of hbcu soccer in the 1930s i'm um, looking at howard um but also uh, places like Hampton and Lincoln. Um, so that, that research is still to be done. Um, I have done research on Howard University in the 1970s um, that looks at their NCAA championship uh, title runs in 1971 and 1974, um, which if you don't know the story, the NCAA uh, strips them of the title in 1971. Uh, they go back and win it in 1974. Um, so, so I've, I've I've written extensively about that. Um, one one uh, kind of avenue of research I'm interested in exploring is um, in women's soccer. Um, the Atlanta Beat, actually, uh, I, I came across an article that, if I'm not mistaken, they they I, for one season at least they were playing their their home games at Morris Brown. Uh, and so I'd be interested to know what that, what that history is like. That's just like something I've been kind of messing around with to, to, to kind of further explore, um, you know, looking at players like Charmaine Hooper from Canada. And, um, so there's, so there's a lot of, there's, yeah, there's some, there's some interesting research to be done, uh, around HBCUs and soccer, um, that, that will, yeah, I will get to it for sure. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Everyone, uh, George Cuse is from Cal State Northridge. Uh, thanks, Jermaine, for the presentation. I uh, enjoyed that very much. Um, I had a question about playing styles and um, narratives about playing styles often get filtered through the lens of um, race or ethnicity. And there's been a lot of good work in this area. I think Paul Campbell had a piece recently in uh, Sport and Society. And at one point in your talk, you mentioned the Falcons being referred to for their uh, improvisational attacks. Yeah, was that yeah. kind of a, a one-off or was it instructive of how they were reported on generally? Um, did the media pay much attention to playing style or was it difficult to get a sense of that given some of the challenges that you noted with, with coverage? Yeah, it was definitely a challenge. Um, and, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> I could have been making a, a, a stretch of the argument, but one thing I'm trying to do, because there's such limited uh, coverage, I'm trying to read 
every word that I'm, that we're given, right, in these articles. And so when they say, you know, it was a surprising move, right, that to me that 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 signals some form of improvisation, right? They they, they do talk about the Falcons uh, and the Maroons as as a very um, you know fast team, right? As a fast kind of attacking team. Um, but other than that, there's not too much about their style, right? Um, so, you know, within the different articles, I mean, there was, a, there was a number of different articles that signaled they may have been keen to improvise with their style, um, but there was nothing explicitly suggesting that, you know, this team is known, right? for you know the twist of the hips and the you know all these you know uh, all these things that we kind of associate with with uh with style and 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 and, uh, and race and so i'm trying to i'm just trying to read the sources a little bit a little bit more uh yeah with yeah just with a little bit more nuance right and so what does it mean for you know a shot to be surprising um at that time right and so it was you know yeah so it just again it could it could have been a stretch but it's it's something. I mean, I think you picked up on it. It's it's exactly what I'm trying to gesture towards. Um, that that they could have been stylistically uh, improvisational, right? Um, that some of the reports lend itself to that. Although there's although although they were not known for that, right? I I, I wouldn't suggest that um, you know the teams were you know our supporters were coming out to see their flashy style, right? Um, but that but that it was capable that that, that they were capable uh, to do that for sure. And that's and that's part of the that's part of the struggle of, of recapturing a lot of U.S. soccer, a lot of early U.S. soccer history, and and, and specifically U.S. Black soccer history, um, is the lack of coverage um, and really trying to imagine um, what what could have been or 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 what was happening, right? So, thank you for that, Jordan. I appreciate it. You know, style is something I'm 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 definitely interested in exploring in other. Um, in other realms of research, right? And so I do a I do some work on Brazil, of course, which 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 kind of lends itself easily to uh, the conversation of style. Um, I do some work on the Netherlands as well, and um, the relationship with Suriname and um, the kind of stylistic uh, contributions that the uh, players of Surinamese descent bring to the this kind of distinct Dutch style of football. Um, so style is definitely something I'm 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 interested in exploring more for sure. Great questions. Uh, let, let's canvas one more time if there are any other questions out there. Either raise your virtual hand or introduce yourself and uh, ask the question. Kevin has another question. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, uh, Jermaine. That one is not coming through. Uh, Kevin is is on the road, uh, I believe, pay, uh, doing the school run. Um, so this is uh, Tom McCabe, and I will ask a question. There seems to me to be something about New York City and soccer in the early 20th century, at the formation of what becomes US soccer, there are some factions. There's a discernible kind of Scottish faction from New Jersey. And then I'll argue a more cosmopolitan faction from Brooklyn that includes a transplanted Thomas Cahill from St. Louis uh, that includes um, Nat Agar and his older brother, uh, and then finally uh, a Harrisonian, another New Jerseyan, uh, an Englishman, Thomas Bagnell. And they are kind of going up against that old Scottish and English kind of faction, if you will. And out of that, I'm looking into the argument of creating, you know, U.S. soccer, which is more cosmopolitan, I use air quotes there, um, than, than a previous kind of regional or pseudo-national uh, governing body. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything in New York that, that 
is any like you know acceptance you know you um come play in our league you know outside mm -hmm. of 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 the workers um you know kind of pan worker movement if you will because mm -hmm. th there's something about new york i think there might be something there at least i wouldn't be surprised so uh, i'll kick that over to you yeah no i mean i think you know Aside from um, you know the one the one incident at the ballroom, I think the Falcons and the Maroons had a had a had a fairly successful and and uh, you know um, a pretty fair treatment right as as a team within 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 these different leagues right. I mean the fact that they were able to play against these white teams at a time when racial segregation was still you know throughout the U.S. Um, is is testament to that, and so I think. Um, yeah, there is something about New York, right? It, you know, the the kind of transnational makeup of, of, of New York, right? I mean, as you said, this kind of progressive um, um, kind of uh, sense of acceptance uh, and belonging throughout New York, um, I definitely think is 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 definitely there, and is, is I think is evident within the story uh, of the Falcons and the Maroons, um, and I also think that. Uh, even within that, right? Even even being a part of this kind of growing U.S. soccer um, uh, landscape, uh, they were also interested in maintaining uh, some of their some of their more um, uh, some of their more uh, native kind of indigenous um, um, cultural cultural origins, right? So I think uh, soccer for them, right, was not simply. Um, again, uh, a site of competition, right? It was it was more so a way to kind of tap back into this Caribbean culture, right? This Caribbean sporting culture, right? Soccer and cricket. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, one thing I didn't talk about were the ways in which, in, you know, like this isn't specific to the Falcons or the Maroons. Um, we, I, we see this throughout a number of different clubs and a number of different sports. A uh, number of different races. Um, you know, the the Falcons were very much interested in hosting socials. Um, you know, different. You know, you know, different dinner socials and party socials uh, for fundraising events, right? And but also, it was during those socials that they're interacting with other teams from other sports, uh, namely basketball. Um, and so we see this in the Amsterdam News, where um, where the Falcons are one of many teams at these different end of the season socials or um, kind of New Year's Eve parties where um, it's a sporting, it's a sporting congregation, right? Um, to, to, to use a concept from uh, my colleague, Derek White, you know, it, it became a sporting congregation. Um, so New York is definitely special, uh, particularly, particularly not just thinking about U.S. sports, but thinking about U.S. soccer and the development of U.S. soccer and its, and its distinct, it is distinct, uh, it's distinct. It's complex uh, constitution, right? And 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 history. So I don't know if that was a I don't know if that was a good answer, but um, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. So on the one way, yes, they're absolutely contributing to the to the development of U.S. soccer, right, as we know it today. Um, but at the same time, they were able to kind of hold on to something that wasn't American, that wasn't U.S., right? That they were they were they were trying to do a little bit of both, right? Kind of again working within and against uh these identifications so thank you and <clears throat> kevin typed in his question from switzerland he's asking similar it's a good follow-up um in this you know sporting congregation that you mentioned are the maroons the falcons rubbing shoulders with the harlem globe trotters yeah. um and then a follow-up you know would be, you know, the role of, you know, Jewish New Yorkers yeah. and um, sport. And, and was there any, you know, uh, link there? Yeah, um, I'm not. So, yes, yeah, I mean, the short answer is I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't come across any links between the Falcons and the Globetrotters. Um, what I did find, and I and I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if he was a Jewish manager, but the the first manager of the Falcons when they when they transitioned to the Manhattan uh, the Manhattan Soccer League uh, after the racist incident at the ballroom when they went when they went to the Manhattan Soccer League, I think their their manager for a few years was was a white 
was a white man, but I can't tell you if it was known whether or not he was Jewish. But I, but I assume that he was still circulating in the leftist political circles, considering the league itself uh, used to be um, a communist, a communist based league. And so I imagine that there was some interracial um, coalition building going on uh, between not just the Falcons uh, and the coach, but the Falcons and other teams uh, throughout throughout those leagues. Whether or not um, whether or not they were Jewish, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's great. We're uh, uh, up uh, near 75 minutes here, and that is uh, perfect timing. So awesome. To wrap up, a thank you to you all for attending great attendance today. And in particular, uh, thank you to Jermaine for sharing his research with us. You know, all the best as you move forward on your research and your writing. It's great and much needed work uh, for American soccer history. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This was fun. And that's our pause. So they can cut the, uh, uh, audio there for the podcast.